This is Christine Deschler. I'm chair of the finance, uh, finance committee. Um, let me confirm that all members are, who are present can hear me. Uh, when I call your name, please um, answer, in the, the answer in the affirmative, starting with Jordan. Jordan? Here. Shane? Here. Jennifer? Sophie? Brian? Carolyn? Carolyn's here. Here. Rebecca? Here. Josh? Grant? Here. Charlie? Here. John? John? Daryl? Here. Annie? Here. Al Jones? Here. Topher? Here. Peggy? Here. Al Tosti? Here. Dean? Dave? Here. And Tara? Here. I'm sorry, I just joined. Is that Jennifer? Is that Jennifer? I just yes, heard. That's Jennifer. Yes, sorry. Right. This open meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, as extended on July 16, 2022. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth through the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus, in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public assets, access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment only in writing by email to tbradley at town.arlington.ma.us.com. For this meeting, the Arlington Finance Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join and comment. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Before turning to the first item on the agenda, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. Um, we typically start each meeting by approving the minutes of the prior meeting, but since I see I uh, I see that the, um, well, you correct me, Timor and Daryl. Do you have everyone from the Capital Planning Committee that you would like, need, or want right now? Yes, everybody who's supposed to be attending tonight is attending. All right, all right. So then. We will just go right to um, the Capital Planning Committee presentation, um, and I'm going to yield the floor to you, Timor, and, and anyone else who wants to talk from the Capital Planning Committee. Just let me um, just tell the new members um, that our FinCon member, Daryl Harmer, is, is, sits on the Capital Planning Committee and is our liaison. So. If you have any further questions or issues after tonight's presentation, Daryl is available. Uh, he's available for us all year long. So 
Um, in Timor, we have reviewed um, the written materials that you gave to us. I I think many of us have re reviewed them in detail. Um, so just have that information going forward. Um, so I think you can just uh, stress what you really want to stress uh, and spend time talking about what you want to talk about um, with the knowledge that we have seen um, the written material. So with that, take it away, Timor. That's great. Thank you very much, Chair Deschler. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, we have many new faces on both FinCon and Capital Planning. Uh, I'm Timor Yantar, the Chair of Capital Planning. Um, and uh, Tara, do you have the uh, deck? Um, we'd like to basically put that up on the screen for uh, as we go through. Um, and then I'll be doing uh, the lead off slide and then I'll be turning over to my colleagues to do their own sections of, of the deck as well. Yes, let me, let me share my screen here one second. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, so we thought we could kick off with a, an in progress uh, picture of renovation here. In the foreground is the Department of Public Works, which is the capital plan's largest project ever. Uh, and then right behind that is Arlington High, which is an exempt project outside of the capital plan. Uh, we'll have more on both of these later. Um, next slide, please. So here's tonight's agenda. Uh, what we are asking you to do, uh, a little bit on who we are, what we do, and what capital is. Uh, then an overview of the major issue that came up this year and that we expect will be with us for a while. Um, what the capital plan has achieved or is currently achieving uh, and how it fits into the, the town budget. Some detail then on the main sources of funds and the recommended uses by department. Um, some specifics on what to do about prior borrowing and on reappropriations. And then finally, the recommended vote. Next slide, please. Tonight, we're asking you to vote favorable action on our FY24 budget, uh, the reappropriation of previously borrowed funds and uh, bond authorization rescission, uh, and then more broadly to uh, endorse our full five-year plan for fiscal 24 through fiscal 28. I also want to thank you all for uh, submitting your questions in advance, which we've uh, provided the answers to through Daryl. Uh, we have a lot to cover tonight, and so um, we're hoping that it'll be helpful in getting through all of our slides uh, to have those already um, covered. Uh, page four, please. Thanks. Okay, this slide recaps our membership and how each of us came to be on uh, capital planning. Um, since we're on Zoom, we clearly have our names next to our video feeds, but I'll go through our members quickly and uh, one of them are here tonight and ask them to just wave their hand, say hello. Um, and also start, I'll start with um, our town's brand new finance director who started just on Monday, um, Alex McGee. Hi, folks. I'm Alex McGee. Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, then we have our uh, recording secretary, Joseph Barr. I waved. Sorry, I didn't realize I was supposed to say hello. <laughs> Good evening. Right, maybe, maybe this is a little awkward. I'm sorry. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go through, through the names. Um, you'll, you'll be hearing from all of us as we go along. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan Houghton, um, Kate Lucian, and Joe Solomon are um, three more of our citizen appointees. Uh, our vice chair, Chris Moore, couldn't make it tonight. Uh, you all know um, vice chair of, of uh, FinCom and our designee to uh, capital planning, Daryl Harmer. Um, and then our town officials, we have um, Ida Cody, our controller, and Jose Farias, our school accountant from APS. Um, Phyllis Marshall, our treasurer, was on the committee until she retired at the end of last month. Uh, and Julie Wayman is our town budget director, and she also couldn't make it tonight. Um, uh, both Chris and Julie's absences are because it's my fault. Um, I broke my wrist, and because of that, we had to postpone our meeting from last week, which they could have made. Um, so I'll be covering most of their slides. All right, moving on to page five, please. So as 
I'm, uh, I'm, I know that you do as well. We divide up our work among several subcommittees. Um, each of these meets with a, a number of town departments, and this is how we cover the entire uh, spectrum of what the town and the school department are asking for for capital. Um, page six. So before I really uh, go into the work that we do, I'd like to take a step back and say why we're doing this. Um, capital expenditures are for long-term assets, um, costly ones that we have to borrow to pay for and that will um, endure for many years. And so the cost of them should be spread out over many years as well. Um, they naturally therefore lead themselves to long-term planning. Um, by creating a plan, we try to reduce um, the amount of uncertainty that's out there. Uh, we also weigh priorities, um, as you know, how to create a budget. Um, and then by having a, this dedicated group that does this over a number of years um, and pays careful attention, we hope that we give both uh, the town and um, all of the other committees and so forth um, re reassurance about um, our process. And more than on our process. Next slide, please. So um, for many of these, this is already familiar. Uh, for new members, um, this is how we do things. Um, every year, we look at the town's year by year budget revenue and allocate 5% of that for capital expenditures. Um, this is for non exempt spending. We don't count the exempt portion. Um, exempt would be the kind that's authorized by uh, our citizens in get exclusion votes. Uh, the, the best example currently is the high school. This creates a separate pool of money paid for by a, a dedicated tax stream for a specific and finite project. So that's outside of the capital plan. Um, but within the, the non-exempt portion, we ask the town's departments uh, when the fiscal year begins in the summer to tell us their requests um, for both the coming fiscal year, that will start the following summer, and for the four fiscal years after that, um, we receive those by early September, which is when our, our committee begins our meetings. Um, we then have our subcommittees meet with the department heads to discuss the requests in detail. Um, we speak with facilities as well about um, the upkeep of the overall physical plant. So for example, questions around, is it a time for, for a new roof for building X? Um, Timo, we lost your audio. I think he froze. We spend too little or more likely too much. Um, Timo, you, you froze for great. Uh, Sorry. Great. When did I when did I freeze? Am I still uh, there? Yeah, you were just finishing talking about exempt versus non exempt. Okay. Um, and a little bit after that. All right. Sorry about you. that. Um, no problem. Hazards of Zoom. Okay. So, yes. Um, okay. So, we were saying that uh, at the start of the summer, when the fiscal year begins, we ask town departments to tell us their requests. Um, and this is for um, the following fiscal year that begins the following summer, as well as the next four fiscal years after that. Um, we get all those requests by the beginning of September, which is when we, we convene our meetings. Um, we then meet with the department heads um, via our subcommittees, get the requests in detail. We talk to facilities about the town physical plant. So questions around things like, is it time for a new roof for building X? Um, we then have the subcommittees present reports to the full committee. We deliberate, we approve or not for the different pl uh, plan items, and we prioritize them. Um, and we look to balance the spending within the 5% rule over the full five-year plan. Um, I think the town's been successful in, in budget with their capital plan since 1987. Um, adhering to the 5% rule has met the town's needs and also provided some guardrails to keep us from spending either too little or more likely too much. 5% um, as a rule, it's not a magic number, but it has worked for the last 30 plus years and it's also in line with what we see at other towns and, uh, and cities. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, so the question that we've gotten in the past uh, is what falls under the capital plan? What is capital? Uh, we've defined capital assets and capital improvements as shown here. And we also publish this every year in our report to town meeting. Um, so they're assets that last for a certain length of time, a certain certain size, 
or that extend the useful life of, a, of an asset uh, or adapt it to a new use. Um, so we then on the next slide show a couple of, of examples of what might be considered capital um, and also a, a, a example painting that wouldn't be considered capital unless it's part of a project that we would be doing anyway. Um, and then we would want to have painting as part of a building rebuild, for example. Um, so then we have three types of items that are in the capital plan. If it's a capital improvement, um, if, it's a, if it's the purchase or lease of a new capital asset, or we also have plans and studies um, that will either lead to a capital improvement project or producing a new capital asset. So using that framework for what is capital, um, we then, oops, sorry, next slide, please. Great. We then craft two, two main things, the, the upcoming fiscal, uh, fiscal year's capital budget, that's the actual spending on these capital items in the coming year, and the five-year plan, uh, which is based on our current estimates, how we would spend out the next five years, um, which sort of has an implicit assumption that nothing changes. Of course, things change immediately. Uh, as, as, as the plan changes, we then make adjustments every year, but the items march on through the, through the five-year plan, and we get updates on costs, we get updates on priorities, et cetera. Um, but having, because these are multi-year multi expenses, it's, it's important to see how things will fit in the coming years. Um, the important thing to know is that town meeting in their vote in May, usually, um, only votes to approve the coming year's FY24's capital budget not the out years. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, we wanted to let you know about two things that we have changed in our practice this year. Um, the first is that uh, we are not trying to micromanage the balance of the out years. What we do is, and you'll see this in a few slides in actual numbers, um, we try to make sure that FY24 is in balance as close to 5%, but not over as possible, and that the total of the next five years is also as close to 5%, but uh, not over 5%. Um, what we're trying to not micromanage right now is 25, 26, 27, and 28, the, the out years of the plan. Um, to do that, we were just sort of, we, in the past, we would sort of artificially say, well, we'll just, you know, either increase or decrease some things that would, we would then adjust the following year anyway. So. We think that actually doing it this way will give us more insight into what we're seeing as possible tight or loose years in, in, uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. So you'll see in a few in these slides, for example, looks like based on what we're seeing right now, next year might be a little more tight. So we'll keep that in mind when we're uh, looking at what we're uh, seeing from the uh, departments uh, in their next year submissions. Also, um, second thing is that we've uh, been trying and we're continuing to try and certainly we'll welcome every opportunity to do so. Um, moving items that we think based upon our classification before um, really should be considered to be operating expenses, but have somehow found their way onto the capital plan over to operating. Um, that's constrained of course, by what room there is on the operating uh, plan. Um, but we want to make sure that if it's, you know, if it, if it sounds like operating, doesn't sound like capital according to our criteria, and there's the opportunity to move it, we will do so. We'll also really try to push hard if there's any new expenses that come to us and they say, oh, for example, um, we're going to get this new um, uh, package to manage something for a department that involves IT, that involves a software license. We could say, well, we could pay for the initial cost, but then if there's a long-term hosting fee, that sounds like operating. So let's split the cost and then have that be over on, on, on the operating budget. So definitely trying to make a, make a push for that um, and sort of uh, enforce more purity among capital and operating. Okay, um, sorry, I'm, I'm talking so long. I, a couple of these slides were other people's slides, but here I am. Um, let me then just talk about a little bit on the, uh, the big picture. Uh, so it's page 12, please. All right, uh, you'll see in, in more detail that we are once again at 5%. Um, our capital budget was $11 million um, before offsets and then uh, $9.5 million net, which is at the 5% number. Um, and you'll see in more detail then throughout this deck 
what it has paid for, is paying for now, and is intended to pay for in 24 and in the out years. Um, but we will note that we felt tight, as we often do, uh, as we are going through the, uh, the process this year. We're seeing a lot of effects of cost escalation, um, general inflation that we're all experiencing in our personal lives, of course, um, supply chain issues making things scarce and therefore bidding up those costs as well. And then because of you know, the fact that uh, prices have spiked in a way that is unfamiliar to, to a lot of people in the last few decades, um, when will it come back down again? Um, when, uh, inflation, that is. When will we see you know, not five or more percent year over year increases in prices? It makes it kind of hard to guess what things will cost in, say, fiscal 28. So we made our best estimates, but it's a little bit more uncertain. Um, also, we're looking at trying to do more in the way of proactive maintenance. You know, an ounce of prevention is a good thing. Um, the town has a general um, desire to improve services and facilities, and so we're, we're feeling that and trying to respond. And one more thing that we've noticed is interest rates. They're on, they're, you know, they've been at historic lows, which has been terrific for financing our bond um, issuances. They've gone up. Um, it's not at historically painful levels, but it's more than it, yet, than it had been. Um, finally, we saw um, ARPA, and I'll talk a little bit more ARPA, about ARPA in a few minutes, but ARPA um, has been a, a useful source of funds, uh, particularly for HVAC in this year, um, also for some, in, for some recreation uses last year. Uh, the problem with ARPA was that it was a windfall and it won't be renewed, so it was great while it lasted. Uh, so part two of this slide, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So to make it all fit, a few things happened. First of all, um, and thank you to uh, APS for, for their responsiveness, um, they withdrew their long-term requests for Audison from their, uh, from their needs on the grounds that it didn't make a lot of sense to be investing in Audison long-term since it's, it's quite likely to be rebuilt. Uh, after having rebuilt the seven elementary schools, um, reopening Gibbs, and now working on the high school, uh, Audison is the last of the schools that would need to be rebuilt. Um, so if that happens after AHS is completed, um, making a long-term investment now wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, we also moved, as I mentioned before, some of the operating expenses off of capital. It wasn't a big change in the dollars, but certainly trying to keep that, that momentum toward moving them to where we think they ought to be. Um, but uh, we also worked as a committee to create a prioritized ranked list of what the um, plan items were and what we thought should and shouldn't be in the plan. Um, and worked then with the town manager's office uh, and through them with the departments to see where we could sharpen pencils, tighten belts a notch, and make a few reductions, delays, or cuts as needed. Um, some of the main scope reductions that you'll see um, in DPW, we, uh, we have been trying every year to increase the amount that we spend on roads. Um, we were unable to do that this year. We level funded them. Um, and we acknowledge that we need to do more for our roads. Um, there was a request to uh, install um, electric, vehicle electric vehicle charging stations, um, which we mixed for the time being, um, and we were with the intention of apply applying for grants to fund this instead. Um, there was a request to uh, do a, 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 a renovation of the Whittemore Robbins estate um, for a number of different purposes. We reduced the scope considerably by about one third. Um, still going forward, we'll talk about that a little bit in a little bit too, but um, definitely a reduction there. Um, do you want to mention that we still have some considerable concerns that will outlast this year and, and go into the, into the future? Um, facilities maintenance, particularly for our schools. Uh, I mentioned that we've been in this uh, program of rebuilding our schools for many years, um, which began with Bracket back in 1999, I think. Uh, the first few schools are now more than 20 years old, and a lot of school systems have an expected lifespan of 20 years. And so we're starting to see that uh, those costs catching up with us. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is uh, while we have the, the largest project that we've ever had in the capital plan, the, the public works department uh, yard rebuild, um, we're trying to figure out when we will have then capacity for the next big project, which given what we've been able to, uh, to attend in the, um, in the plan in recent years, 
the next sort of department that is due would be libraries, um, which is uh, coincidentally fortunate because the state um, built a Bureau of Library Commissioners is reopening their um, library grant program in the near future. So we can apply for that, hopefully get some matching funds for that. Okay, I'm gonna pause now because I've been talking for a long time. Um, anything that I, people wanted to just uh, ask Matt about before I, I turn it over briefly to um, Alex McGee. Anyone has, does anyone have any questions as to the material that Timor has covered so far? If so, uh, Al Tosti, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I don't understand. The Odyssey was rebuilt, uh, was the first school to be rebuilt. I can understand having to replace a roof for uh, upgrade a, a, a boiler system or, or air conditioning or something like that. But it, it you almost made it sound like we need to rebuild the school. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was the first one to be rebuilt uh, back in the 90s. Um, and it is, and that was, and have you been in the Austin recently? <laughs> Do you have kids go to the Austin? Um, anyway, it's it it um, it's in not the greatest shape, and um, I've, I've I have spoken uh, with the superintendent of public schools, who does intend to uh, explore getting um, MS, uh, MSBA um, funding for an honest and rebuild um, following the the high school. MSBA policy is that. They won't fund two big projects in the same town at the same time. So it will have to be contingent on the high school program uh, finishing first. So, but it, was, it could still take place in the, in the latter part of this decade. Uh, Al Jones. Thank you. Uh, Timor, sort of following up on Al's comment, did I hear you say that a school typically has a, has a life of 20 years? No, I'm saying that things like roofs or boilers or um, major systems um, can be expected to uh, last that, that length of time. And it's often shorter if it's something like, as opposed to an entire rebuild, if it's a, if it's a, a rehab um, that may not address all the needs in a, in a building envelope that uh, you'd otherwise be getting more bang for your buck for, or longer term bang for your buck for a, a full rebuild. Do, do you have any sense that maybe we're spending too little up front and paying for it later? I mean, are we, are we, nickel, are we you know, build, building at too low a cost and getting too little life out of it? I don't know if we're doing that with the school rebuilds. Um, I've seen a few examples of, and we, we may even come up tonight about, um, projects that were underscoped and then because they were underscoped we had to pay for it later because the need is still there um I, what, the thing that i actually worry about most i'll just be just it, given the inflationary environment is that we'll have a certain amount that we'll be able to pay for for a project and then we'll be hit by cost overruns and we'll have to value engineer and in the process of doing so we may we may have end up having quality issues. Um, if you look at the Gibbs School as an example, it was built in two parts, the first in the 20s and the second in the 70s. And they, and they did, did the, the renovation of that um, in, the, uh, in the last few years. Um, the, uh, the contractors were looking at it and everybody was saying, why on earth is the new part, the part that's falling apart? You know, the 20s part is, is very solid, the 70s part is not, and it's because the 70s were a period of high inflation and we had a lot of substandard construction that happened throughout the country and presumably in that building as well. So that was why they were seeing more work to be done in the younger part of, of the gift school. Yeah, okay. Well, it seems like something to be cautious about, but thank mm -hmm. you. Ida. Uh, I just wanted to mention that I had a conversation with Mike Mason. He told me that um, they had a study last year in 22 in April done for this Odyssey school. And uh, they did the study to see what kind of repairs it needs. And it came up to over $20 million. This was last year in April. Um, 
who knows how much it would be now, probably over $30 million. Their original request on this year's capital project for the next five years was uh, $5 million. But since they're really considering rebuilding, then they withdrew all the requests and we will be probably be looking at rebuilding. Thank you, Ida. Um, Charlie, you have your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I just, in response to uh, Alan's comment about the Odyssey, um, it was originally uh, bid and uh, costed at about 8.6 million, but by the time it was finished, it expanded in scope and I think it closed out at about 14 and a half million and it took us a long time to pay for it. But um, it, I don't think that it, the, the project was initially shortchanged. So far. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two questions. So one is um, you mentioned library size projects. Would that be the Fox or wasn't Robbins, didn't Robbins get expanded a while ago? So I'm just curious as to what you would think is the next one for the libraries. Probably Fox. That's uh, We received a, a, um, a draft uh, of a um, letter of intent from Anna Litton, our director of libraries, who um, is looking at applying for that um, uh, Mass uh, Bureau of Library Commissioners grant program. So the first step in that is letter of intent. The application would be a year from now. Um, and for Fox, uh, you're right that uh, we did a, a, a redo of um, the, uh, the Robbins Library uh, not that long ago. Um, there are some smaller projects they're looking at doing it in Robbins, but Fox, um, and there, there are questions Oh, he's freezing again. Yeah. Hopefully he'll come back. You're 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 freezing on us, Timur. We can't hear you. Hello. Now you're, you're back. back now. Hello. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why. Um so I was talking about Fox. Yeah. Yeah. So here, I, I, I will actually stop my video if that helps us in order to maybe reduce the bandwidth issues here and just talk. Um, so, as I was saying, um, Anna Litton, um, letter of intent, uh, she's intending to do for, for, the, for the Fox. Um, the Fox is a building that it's uh, a good amount of use, obviously, but also it has the it has some serious constraints. One of which is that it is not uh, ADA compliant. It, it has a uh, non-working elevator, uh, which is terrible because there, there's a community room in the basement which you can't use if you need to use it need to access it by elevator. Um, so again, earlier early stages. It's, we've been talking about this for a number of years, but it got. Uh, it, I think that the um, the grant process from the state is triggering a bit more of a focus on moving it forward. Uh, and it would be great to get the state funding, which can be on the order of about half of the total cost. Um, there are some open questions around whether it would be a um, standalone building as it is now, or if it would be a multi-use building um, that would uh, incorporate some additional stories and what if that would be housing or what. So she's, she is also looking into that. And Topher, you have one more question, and then I think we'll continue. Go ahead, Topher. My other question was just um, the 5%. That's a best practice, but not enforced by statute or bylaw or anything. The 5% of the total budget being capital. That's correct. There's no statute. Um, we, uh, we're not sure. We think that by continuing to follow that practice every year, um, that gives some comfort to rating agencies um, and helps us keep our AAA rating. Great, thank you. And let me add by keeping to that 5% year after year enables us to keep to that 5% so that when we have other constraints and people want more money, um, there's, there's, they, they don't uh, try to grab that 5% or they're less successful in trying to grab that 5%. So practice by being a practice continues to be a practice in good times and bad. So uh, for that, I think it's a, it's a good thing. All right, Timur, go ahead. Okay. 
Thank Floor you. yours again. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and um, I'm going to turn it over now for the next slide to uh, Finance Director Alex McGee to talk about capital plan, plan progress. Sure. Uh, thank you, Timur. So um, I'm going to just give brief updates on these capital plan uh, projects that you see in front of you here on the screen. Um, as noted, today is my third day on the job, so I'm going to do my best to give uh, sort of the right level of summary detail here. So without further ado, the Town Hall Envelope Project. Um, so a full study assessment was done, um, and we will receive cost estimates for the work soon. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the timeline on that is. Um, so, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, looking, uh, We're also in the process of automating doors into the select board chambers um, to make those ADA accessible. Um, I also understand that there is an application into the Community Preservation Commission uh, Committee for uh, funding a portion of the envelope work. Uh, moving on to the engineering study for electrification of schools, um, a consultant study, I believe we just received it, um, like I think maybe this week. Um, and so this could open the door the door to uh, a number of electrification projects uh, within some of our schools and then potentially down the road to more municipal buildings, more municipal facilities. So um, I understand the consultants who put that together will be doing a presentation and the uh, CPC will be invited to that. Uh, the Hardy and Pierce playgrounds, those projects have both been completed under budget. Uh, voting machines, uh, I haven't had a chance to connect with the town clerk yet. Um, I understand she's been out this week, um, so I don't have an update on that, but um, I do understand it was a pretty urgent need. And so once I have something, I'll circle around and email the chair. Uh, the Audison repairs, we sort of touched on this um, and uh, essentially... I think the plan for now is to work on only urgent, uh, like em emergent needs. Um, and so currently there's some HVAC work and um, some PA system, public address system work going on um, with the HVAC needed to sort of keep uh, classroom temp temperatures comfortable and the PA system is sort of a, a safety issue. So um, holding off on any other non-urgent needs until a larger MSBA involved project uh, as noted. Um, some other projects that have been completed recently include an elevator, some ex exterior stair repairs, um, some rooftop HVAC units, and the lift. All right, uh, moving on to vehicle replacements, um, sort of sprinkled across a number of departments. Um, the big one being uh, in fire, a, a new pumper was ordered. Um, there's a long lead time on this build out. It's about 18 months uh, with the planned delivery in this December. Uh, 2023. So money's been encumbered, but it won't go out the door until we take delivery of the truck. Um, also in fire, um, an air supply unit, which uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, the, the function of that. And then a, a sort of, uh, I spoke with the chief today and he, they, they've combined sort of two vehicles down into one um, with an F-350 uh, utility vehicle with sort of a box body. Um, and so the same story on the as the pumper that's been ordered the build out is ongoing with the planned delivery either this summer or early in fy24 uh, same thing money's been encumbered but it won't be paid out until uh the unit is delivered uh, moving to police um there's been so so for police all of the vehicles have been ordered and delivered or currently in service so we're looking at four cruisers um typically they uh, they do three cruisers a year um, with vehicle shortages in the past. We played catch up this year. Um, and then an all electric parking enforcement vehicle and a transit van for animal control. Uh, Public Works had sort of a variety of different vehicles, um, a backhoe, a street sweeper, a chipper, a forklift, and a compressor truck. Um, those have all been either ordered and or delivered. Um, for the vehicles that have been ordered, their expected delivery is before the end of FY23. Uh, for the ice rink, um, there's been some capital work done there over the last couple of years. Um, the most recent project to be completed, which is just completed recently, was a, a bleacher lift project. Um, and Joe Connolly said that there's nothing else I'm going there for the rest of the year. Um, school and IT projects. Um, there's sort of a variety of different projects, uh, the biggest being classroom devices um, at the, within the school department. Um, but the total is sort of seven different categories, uh, totaling $670,000. There's about $230,000 left to be spent in FY23 um, across those categories. 
um, spoke with our CIO th today, and um, she's got a plan to have all the money sort of expended by the end of the fiscal year. Um, moving on to sort of uh, some uh, water sewer roadway projects. Um, our DPW commissioner said that uh, he, he doesn't really have um, specific, like with these kinds of projects, unless there's like a named project, he sort of does high value work. And uh, how he described that to me means that he doesn't want to dig up a new street just to put in, um, you know, some subterranean infrastructure. Um, he wants to sort of do it at a time where it makes sense. So if there's going to be um, road repairs, then we'll try to tackle water repairs at the same time. Um, road and sidewalk improvements. Um, there is a specific project, the Chestnut Street Road sidewalk project, which is slated to start in April. Beyond that, it's the same thing. It's going to be, uh, you know, where where we can get to high value work. Um, repairs based on priority with the um, CPI, the pavement index report. Um, and that'll, you know, that work will be ongoing all throughout the spring, summer, and into fall as the uh, weather allows. Um, the biggest update, the Mystic Bridge. Um, this is still on hold due to a, a utility coordination issue. Um, Verizon, I guess, is sort of currently on the hot seat. Um, and so there's other utility issues as well, though, gas and electric. So uh, it's a pretty complicated uh, project, but um, working on that. Um, the DPW building, uh, Timur touched on this earlier, but building E and building A are both slated to open very soon uh, this spring. Um, and once those open, other phases of work on that project will move forward. Um, so that's moving on time. Uh, the community center project that is nearly complete. Um, punch list items are currently being dealt with, and it should be like fully closed out very soon. Uh, the high school, um, you know, you could spend a month speaking about this project on its own. Um, there's a really good detailed website to, to get updates on. Um, what you all know is that phase one is complete. Um, and phase two is underway um, with sort of, you know, superstructure being built out right now. Um, but I would encourage you to visit the website for detailed um, updates on that. Um, so uh, Whittemore Robbins Complex, um, this is um, planned for use for uh, HHS um, with additional space being offered to the um, AYCC. Uh, town Hall, the plaza renovation, um, that was sort of paused um, at a reasonable point last year. And they're going to pick up where the flagpole is and head towards the parking lot um, starting this spring. So, you know, very soon once the uh, snow is done falling. Uh, Veterans Memorial Park, um, there's a plan to look at a sort of a full renovation of this park, um, looking at sort of a whole suite of different funding sources for this, uh, including uh, you know, state and federal earmarks, um, among other things. Uh, and then this isn't on the slide, but there was, there's a, I guess, Poets Corner. Um, there, there's an, currently a moratorium on building turf fields in town. Um, and there's an, a forthcoming meeting to sort of discuss the future of turf fields. And then, um, you know, based on the outcome of that, then uh, Poets Corner, I believe, will be able to be considered. So that was a lot. Um, I, I don't have a ton of detail on these. I had to scrounge for them, so but I can try to take any questions and field them if possible. Does anyone have any questions for Alex over what he just covered very, very well, very quickly? Any questions? Jennifer. I just have a, a really basic question. So I've been hearing about envelope repairs for years. And I was just curious what that was. And I, so beyond sort of brick repointing, what else happens? Sure, you're talking about town hall? Town hall or Hardy or, you know, I, I just, I've been hearing about envelope repairs and I just- Sure, yeah. Just, I know, I just not not sure what it is. Okay, yeah, so so when you think of the envelope, just think of the outside of the building. So anything that can be, um, you know, can be deteriorating or falling apart or damage on the outside of the building. Um, and what the sort of source cause of that is. Um, I know the bell tower on uh, Arlington Town Hall has been the, like is sort of the source of a lot of these issues uh, on the envelope now. And so it's water penetration has become a real problem. Um, so uh, so anything on the exterior of the building um, that needs work uh, when you're looking at masonry. So anything that's granite or stucco or um, anything like that, um, it, the work becomes very specialized and very expensive. and um, so uh, there is a full study, and um, I saw it somewhere today. It's it, it was linked 
somewhere, um, maybe even in in this agenda. But uh, there, there's a um, there's an envelope study on town hall that um, is floating around somewhere. So um, if you look at that, it'll give you all the information you could ever want about sort of the envelope at town hall and what the sort of issues, the world of issues are right now. I think we were able. I think we were able to to get the the report and then forward it on through Daryl um, for your uh, bedtime reading. Yeah, um, yeah it, is really, like it is on our SharePoint. Site. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. As Daryl points out, it is on our SharePoint site. Um, I don't see any other hands, so um, continue. All right, and I'm going to put my video back on just for, and hope that nothing freezes um, for now. But thank you, Mr. McGee. Um, next slide, please. All right, here we want to show how we arrive at the five percent target. It's a two-part uh, um, process here. So we have the town budget here as of uh, January fifteenth in the manager's budget, uh, where when we decide to freeze the numbers. Um, and part of our approach uh, is that we consider um, uh, that the items that are non-core to be sort of alongside or above and beyond the the budget that we're trying to calculate five percent of. So. We take those out of the total. We don't think that, for example, our 5% should be calculated off of budget for exempt debt. That's this separate um, citizen uh, elected um, uh, revenue stream that is you know, above and beyond the rest of the budget. So we take out uh, both the uh, exempt debt service and the enterprise funds to arrive at an adjusted total town budget. That's a that bottom line there. And then next slide, please. That number is then the input for what we call it there, the pro forma budget line near the bottom. So uh, $189.8 million in the fiscal 24. We then take 5% of that, that's our target. Um, and we compare that with what our net non-exempt plan is a few rows up, up from there. And you'll see that it's just under the 5% number. We are we came in by um, $1,100 of, of wiggle room. Um, but how do we get to that number, the net non-exempt plan? Starting at the top, we sum our prior debt service. So what we incurred in prior year's borrowings, um, this current year's cash expenses, um, we, we uh, in, in the out years, we'll see us that we're adding in uh, new debt service. But in fiscal 24, if we have um, new bonding in 24, we don't start paying debt service on that until 25. So there's actually no new debt service for 24 in the 24 plan, which is actually one more reason why it's very important for us to look at a five year plan. Otherwise, it looks like, hey, you're borrowing things for things and they're free, but they actually hit us immediately afterward in years two, three, four, five, and beyond. And finally, we have a category for ban interest. Bans are bond anticipation notes. They're short-term loans that we, in this case, are uh, borrowing um, for the DPW in, in, in anticipation of a, of a future bond issuance next year. So those pieces um, add up to the total gross non-exempt plan cost. So that's $11 million in 24 and then more in the out years. And then we adjust that by taking out direct funding from items such as enterprise funds. Um, also, we take out uh, certain dedicated funds uh, like the dollars that are specified to be used for capital by overrides. For example, we had overrides in both 2011 and 2019 uh, in which the town manager's office, me, the, uh, the select board uh, promised that um, they would use a portion of the, uh, of, of the proceeds for these purposes. So there's some that's being used for roads and the number is a weird number because it started out as a, as a nice round number and that's been escalating by two and a half percent every year since then for roads. Uh, and then in 2019, we had the same kind of thing for um, uh, that, that uh, earmarked uh, $200,000 in, in the first year and that's escalated since then for uh, what we called um, accessibility improvements, which uh, really, uh, we mentioned this in one of our uh, answers to, to the pre questions. Um, it's things like um, addressing uh, the um, sidewalks where we have, for example, a lot of uh, bricks that tend to get frost heaves, tend to be really hard on people, particularly people who have some mobility issues. 
Um, and so we've been looking at you know where where possible uh, replacing them or uh, or you know, entirely or at least fixing them so that they are flatter again. Um, but I, I, I digress slightly. So we're taking those out because those are again alongside the capital plan, but they're they're specified to be used for capital by these overrides. Taking these all out gets us to that net non-exempt number, and that's what we're trying to get to fit in the five percent. And again, as you, as I mentioned before. We're at the 5% number for fiscal 24. We're at the 5% number for the total column all the way over at the right. Um, we're not at the 5% number for, for the interim years. We're above it in 25 and 26, 26 barely, and we're below it in 27 and 28. So we're seeing if nothing were to change, we're seeing that next year would be tight, and then we'd be seeing an approximately flat year in 26, and then we'd be seeing some room in 27 and 28. Things, of course, will change. Okay, now just a little bit about um, the uh, funding sources and funding uses, and then I will stop talking again. So, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, our funds, like Gall, are divided in three parts. Um, we have cash and bond and other. Uh, cash expenses are straightforward. They're what we pay for this year out of current general fund uh, tax revenue. Um, they're paid for it in their entirety in, in this year. Bonds means that we borrow funds and pay them back over multiple years with interest. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, there's no cost to the plan in the year of the, of the issuance of the bond. We then have the, uh, the debt service coming to us in, in future years. Um, our general rule is to bond for items that cost over $100,000. Um, and as long as they're not part of a general regular purchase program, like those computers that Alex McGee mentioned before, um, we have, we have um, a uh, $400,000 per year program of paying for new PCs to cycle through for, all, for our, our kids and our, and our teachers in our, in our school system. Um, so we're just paying that out every year. Um, that's, we don't think that that should be bonded, it should be a, a cash expense. Similarly, we have a vehicle program for the police department. We, we pay for three vehicles every year. It's about $160,000 per year. We pay for those in cash. Um, but but uh, larger things that are um, sort of um, big, clunky, high dollar um, items uh, that aren't hitting us every year, those are bonded. Finally, other. Other is outside funds. Um, they're not part of the tax revenue. They're state funds like Chapter 90. Uh, they're federal funds like ARPA. Um, there's other grants that we get. There's user fees, enterprise funds, trusts, et cetera. Uh, it's stuff that um, we're glad to have that as additional sources of funding. Um, and you'll see that part of our, um, you know, uh, part of our public, public works in, in particular is heavily other. Um, I mentioned ARPA. Um, next slide, please. ARPA is the American Rescue Plan Act. It was enacted uh, in March 21st, federal law for pandemic recovery. It provided um, $1.9 trillion to the entire country, um, which then broke out uh, by state and by locality. Arlington received about $35 million. Uh, it's been put to many uses, including capital. Um, one of the main capital uses has been for HVAC systems. Improve HVAC is a direct uh, response to people having to breathe the same air in buildings during, during the, the pandemic. Um, in 24, we're putting about $1.7 million of this other ARPA money uh, to use for HVAC purposes as shown, partly schools, partly town. Um, again, this was a great thing to have to address our backlog of projects but it's a one-time windfall, so it will be going away in the next few years. There'll be a few more. I think at 25, you can use ARPA money, and then it cuts off um, by the end of calendar 26, which would be um, uh, halfway through the uh, 27 capital plan, or this year, excuse me. Okay, um, oh, so I see Alan. Mr. Jones, oh, sorry, I should say Chair Deschler. 
Go ahead, Al. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Timur, how do you calculate the number for the two override commitments? Oh, um, we began with uh, what the original number was. So back in 2011, I think it actually, well, they were voted in 2011. It was then uh, put into practice in 2013. Um, I don't actually remember off the top of my head what that number was. But then every year we escalate by two by by, by, by two point five percent. For the twenty nineteen override, the first year one was um, twenty twenty one, and it was two hundred thousand um, dollars, and that has then been going up by two and a half percent every year since then. And, and you consider those they'll be there forever? Is that what the commitment was? I think so. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions right now for Timo or Capital Planning? All right, one more for me and then I'll release off for a while. Um, so page 19, please. Okay, great. So I was talked about sources, now we're talking about uses. So here we show a breakout of what we're spending in 24, 24 about 13.4 million. And this number is not the same as the 5% number that you saw. This is out of pocket cost this year. This, the 5% number um, doesn't have debt service from bonds this year, but does have prior debt service. This is how much does, well, everything costs that we're, that we're buying this year and then we're going into bond for part of it. It's you know like paying for your, with, with a, a credit card. Also the 5% number doesn't include the other portion. So we have here this year, how much we're gonna spend cash for, bond for, and other for. Um, as shown, public works and schools are about three quarters of our total capital budget. Um, and I mentioned before that public works has a large other component due to the water and sewer fund. Um, what we've done in the following slides is we've uh, tried to order the department specific detail in rough order of capital budget share. Uh, so I'll take questions one more time and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Al Jones, you still have your hand up, but do you have a, all right, um, John, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, regarding the, the, the 5%, it seems like, uh, so you get 7 million relates to debt service and then 3.9 million relates to uh, kind of current cash outlays. That, that we we purchase these these capital items with with cash mm -hmm. um, so it, it seems to me like the only thing that you could really control going into next year is the 3.9 million for the cash outlays because the seven million's already been committed like there's nothing anyone could do here tonight that would change that seven million dollar number that's that's already been agreed to in prior years uh, so I assume it's kind of locked in so I guess my question is do you determine what you purchase currently and what you pay for cash for? Is it to some extent driven by what's available, like what, how much space you have between the 7 million and the 5%? So, I mean, we try to bond, again, large items because we feel that they, um, we should not try to squeeze large items into our plan in a given year. And we can't, as you pointed out, there, there's only so much room to pay for things with cash. Um, the reason that we, that we think bonding makes sense, and it makes even more sense in low interest rate environments, because we are still in one, even though it's gotten higher than it used to be, just because they, these are multi-year assets. And so they, um, they, we shouldn't like pay for something that will benefit the town for the next 20 years and, and charge it all to one to one cohort this year. So we spread it out over multiple years by paying them a debt service. So yes, you're right that we're constrained in how much we can actually pay for things with cash this year because we are constrained by what we, what we bonded for in the past. Um, it's kind of like looking at your, your personal budget and saying, I got to pay my old credit card bills or my mortgage, and then I can pay certain things right now, and then I'll charge new things for next year and pay for yeah. it next year. So yeah. Mm. Got it. Thank you. And maybe a quick follow-up. So 
you know, and I look out over the next few years and it looks like, you know, we're pretty consistent outlays over the next few years. And I'm just wondering, you know, in a rising interest rate environment, is it possible that the amount available for, you know, current outlays, is there any possibility that the debt service would get close to the 5% number? Like right now you got a nice, you know, cushion, or I should say a window of 3.9 million. I assume all else being equal with debt, debt service uh, and interest rates rising, that 3.9 million could get lower and lower. Is there any chance you could get to zero? I mean, anything's possible. I think that we have, a, our, for example, our largest piece of, of debt service right now is debt service on the, on the public works building. And we were able to get that in during low rates, like, like historically low rates. Yeah. Um, when we had the last large issue, and it's not the most recent one, but like I think two years ago, we, were, we got the terrific rate of, you know, 1.77%. So that's, you know, not free, but as close as it gets in real life. So, um, yeah. We're 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 still riding that that benefit of um, of low rates, and even today, you know, rates are not as low as they were, but they're still quite on the low side. So I I hear your I hear your question. Yeah. Um, we have to be mindful of rising rates. Um, you know, and you know, don't ask anybody to predict where they're going to go because they'll get it wrong. Um, but uh, I'm not worried about us crowding out our our plan in any um near time soon got it thank you and actually maybe if i could sneak in one more quick fall very quick follow question uh in modeling out the debt service costs you know for the next four or five years is that pretty solid like you know like are we just basically saying this this amount is due or is it an estimate i did go back and look at 23 i think 23 was forecasting 6.5 million for the current year and it's up to 7 million so you know, it seems like a half a million dollar increase. So I guess my question is, how solid are the um, the forecasts for the, the the debt service going forward? I mean, they're they're we try to be really conservative. Um, in fact, one thing that we do is we um, assume a higher interest rate than is currently the case, uh, and we are often then um, pleasantly surprised when we do the issuance and get a lower rate and then are able to say, look, there's a little bit more room to plan than we thought. So I think we're trying to be as um, not worst case, but bad case scenario so that we have some wiggle room. Um, and, you know, if, if things are actually do turn out to be as bad as we had forecast, we're still not, you know, saying, oh, now we're in a hole that we have to, have to dig ourselves out of. Got it. Got it. Yeah. But there was, so it does look like, and I, I don't know if I'm looking at all the right numbers, but it does look like there was about a maybe $500,000 increase from last year's forecast to get to the uh, seven, seven million oh thirty six this year. But um, is that just kind of par for the course or just something things happen? Uh, it may have been a timing issue as well in terms of okay. just, you know, bringing some more, more debt uh, that was going to be do, done later um, earlier on. Got it. I, All I right. That we, that we had we had we had we had a, um, we did our issuance in December, not in um, the usual February March timeframe this year, just because we wanted to capture rates before they kept on going up even for, even further. Got it. Okay, so pull some forward. All right. Well, thank you very much. Charlie, you have a hand up. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> John, this is a, just a comment. Uh, what protects that cash number going forward is that the debt service, the historic debt service is always rolling off. So, you know, there are, there are, there's debt service in there that might be going back 10 or 15 years and ending. So yeah. the old debt is declining and then you're putting in new debt. So it doesn't necessarily automatically crowd out the cash number. Got it. That Thank makes you sense. for that. Thanks, Charlie. Jennifer. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so my head's been in the DPW budget uh, for the last few days, and I was just wondering how common is it um, for something to, for us to be able to get reimbursements from the state or something else? And, and I'm thinking of the the toters, right, that that potentially half of the, the, the cost will potentially come back to us. Is that is that a odd one-off thing or is that a common occurrence? Uh... 
that's a relatively odd one-off thing. Um, the you know, we we do get um, some state uh, grant money for um, green initiatives. Um, we, if, if we're looking at green vehicles, for example, now uh, DPW is probably, uh, with, with the exception of like some smaller vehicles that they have, DPW is one of our least well suited for green vehicles because they're heavy duty vehicles that need to, you know, shove snow around and and and, and uh, carry asphalt and so forth. And so um, those are uh, we're, we're not we're, we're not as far along um, with the electric vehicles for those kinds of things. But um, I, I do remember, for example, that we had a um, a green vehicle for their uh, for um, inspectional services, which is part of DPW. Um, and so they they um, were able to get some uh, state funds to offset the cost of that. Thank you. So go ahead, Timor, the floor is yours again. All right. So like I said, we use this to order our um, uh, the department's uh, specific, specific slides, excuse me, um, in rough order of capital budget share. So I'm going to stop talking for real now and turn this over to my colleagues, beginning with Joe Solomon, to talk about public works. Thank you, Timur. Uh, I have three slides. I'll go through them and then pause for questions at the end. The first one here is just an update on the public works facility. I believe it's been mentioned a couple of times already, but it's uh, an ongoing, very large project. Uh, happy to say that it is on budget at this point. Um, this is on Grove Street, by the way, if you get a chance to drive by um, the, this new building. Um, the finishing work is, is underway on the new building and that is on track to be wrapped up in spring of this year. There's also a portion of the project that incorporates the existing building that's on track for completion in fall of this year. Next slide, please. One of the other large um, expenditures that was discussed is trucks. Um, what I've done here is broken out the spend showing the average spend per year for the two. Um, there's many line items that fall under these in the capital plan, but I think a, a summary is, is more helpful. So for roadways over the five years, there's an average of about $1.7 million per year for sidewalks, um, for curbs and curb ramps. The average funding is a little over $900,000 per year. Um, these amounts are sort of driven by a couple of reports that were done. Uh, for roadways, there was a 2019 pavement management report. I believe there was a question asked about this. It should be updated within the next one to two years. Um, the Director of Public Works likes to update it on approximately a five-year cycle. And this provides us with a town-wide score and then a dollar amount to hit different numbers above and below that score. So it gives us guidance on how much we would have to spend to move that score sort of up or down a few points. And again, that's a scale of zero to 100. So um, just to give some context there. So based on that, in 2019, the, the sort of gate was on the low end $1.5 million a year to maintain a score of 78. Uh, $2 million a year to maintain a score of 80. Um, on sidewalks, there is a older report. This was a one-time report that was done. Um, and in that, the score, same zero to 100 scale, but obviously looking at a different type of asset was 76.7. Um, in that case, there wasn't a, uh, a target provided because there's a lot of sub assets in there, right? There's a the sidewalks, there's the curb ramps, there's the curbs themselves. Um, but the, the approach is to take all the money that is given to sidewalks, curbs, and ramps and spend it against that backlog. And there's a, a you know, sidewalk quality inventory that's out there that they use for guidance on you know, how to identify where that money can be spent. And if we can go to the third and final slide. So here we've split out in FY24 and then the four out years, um, what the capital requests are. Uh, really, you know, that, that road and sidewalk money 
is a lot, right? So that's most of that that highway money. I think Timur talked about the the water and sewer money as well. Um, again, for vehicles, most of that is also requested by the highway department. Those are plows, large trucks, um, you know, large expensive vehicles. And again, you see similar patterns in the out years. Um, you know, that, that road and sidewalk money, putting the highway number up pretty high with the associated vehicles, um, water and sewer being a, also a large spend as well. So those are the three slides. I'd like to pause here if folks have any questions. Any questions for Jill? Uh, Jill, I have a question. How do we compare, how does Arlington comp compare in terms of roadway roadways and sidewalks to comparable communities in terms of road conditions and sidewalk conditions. Do you know the answer to that? I, I mean, ultimately, I would, I would defer to Mr. Rademacher as, as the expert in that. I had done some homework as, as this is my first year. Um, you know, I, I found a statewide group that had done a survey and in that one we were like 11th in the state. But, you know, the, these scores do go up and down over time. Um, 11th in terms of good or 11th in terms of bad good good okay. right and and there's some sort of anecdotal data of of you know when a, a large source of this funding is chapter 90 funds that come in so it, it's the state providing hundreds of thousands of dollars to towns and i was reading interviews with other directors of public works who were saying like yeah that's nice but it really just like it makes a dent in what i need to do so th this is something that kind of seems to just be underfunded in general, but I think the folks at DPW do a very good job with making do with the funds that we have. Um, they, they do these recurring reports to update the inventory. They have a, um, a computer program that guides them and creates their road work inventory. So it, it is optimized to some degree. It's not you know based on people's opinions. So there is efficiency there. Right, just on, on, on chapter 90, by the way, so the state, the state gives out um, $200 million a year in total chapter 90 funds um, to, to the 351 cities and towns of the Commonwealth. And there's a, a complicated formula that, that looks at both population and road miles. Uh, and so while we have a, you know, a decent sized population, we're a little under 1% of the state. We don't get one percent of the funds because we have we're also small because we don't have, don't have a lot of road miles. So we're at about um, three quarters of a million dollars per year in Chapter Ninety, but it certainly helps in in, in our budget. It's a it's a big share of our total highway um, or roadway uh, dollars. Charlie, you have a hand up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so very very good presentation, Joe. Thank you. Uh, um, does this chart, is this showing expenditures in the given year or is it, or are these, does this include debt service on um, various expenditures in the past? In other words, how much of the capital budget debt service is allocated to um, DPW? I'm going to say, I don't think this is showing debt service based on my understanding, but Timur, do you want no, to- No, it's not. This is, yeah. this is the current year uh, cost. So, you know, what we have, what we project to pay for, say vehicles in 24 for cemetery or vehicles in the out years for yeah. um, highway. So no, this is not shared debt service. So for example, the, the, the cost of the DPW building itself isn't reflected here. Correct. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so um, I think I'm up. I'm next. So um, Tara, if you could just advance the slides. Uh, my name is Kate. I actually sit on the Arlington High School Building Committee and on the High School Finance Committee. Um, I think Alex actually touched on this pretty uh, thoroughly. We are in the middle of phase two, uh, wrapping up this fall and uh, set to start on the athletics wing shortly thereafter. The website is really thorough, but I'm here if uh, anyone has any questions to be answered in this meeting. All right, does anyone have any questions regarding the high school build? No questions? 
I think I turn it over to Ida for the next. Oh, sorry, too soon. Go ahead, Tof. <laughs> yeah, just um, in terms of phase two and opening up, and um, is it? It says open nine twenty three. Is that the beginning of the school year, or is there some overlap, or there is there some delay in that? And if so, like you know, what happens in terms of moving students around? Yep, um, there is uh, currently, although this is always a moving target, uh, a, a delay uh, in finishing phase two before um, the start of the school year at the beginning of September. However, um, we've uh, retained. Fusco House um, to be able to start school and accommodate the numbers of students on campus during that interim period. They'll start abatement and demo in the Blue Gymnasium, um, but not the Fusco House at the same time. So that will buy some time. The primary impact from a um, school perspective on that is that the preschool will not move in before the Thanksgiving holiday, um, but they have temporary space that they are in and it doesn't impact their programming. So, and they're at the Parmenter, um, aren't they? I'm sorry, say that again. They're at the Parmenter, right? They're yes. at the uh, Parmenter, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Over to uh, I turn Jonathan over to Eva. next, actually. Oh, Jonathan, sorry. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yes, hello. I just have a um, couple of slides here, and these really give a, a few details of um, the major expenses related to the schools. Um, together, they're about 5.9 million out of the roughly eight and a half million um, that will be needed over the next five years. Um, so the um, Bishop School, uh, the big item here is a roof replacement, which is scheduled for um, fiscal 24 at 1.6 million. So that's a big ticket single item. And then uh, RTU, that's uh, rooftop units uh, for uh, uh, generally cooling, and EMS, which is energy management systems. These are upgrades, which, uh, as you can see, will be funded by ARPA um, and are um, more modest in total expense. Um, we, there will be a need for further envelope repairs uh, on the Bishop. Um, originally, those were... Uh, penned in at um, 950,000 in the initial capital budget that we got in September, but um, it's felt that that could probably be uh, kept to about half a million. Um, the, the, the committee has talked a certain amount about uh, issues related to, for example, sealing the outside of buildings, and we've been quite skeptical about the need of that and sometimes sent some of these um, um, this message back to sort of see what, what is really needed. Um, the bishop also, uh, there's an idea, a need for uh, a reconfiguration of the front office. There are currently three offices. The idea is to provide a fourth, which could be used by a councillor, and a small uh, area that would in, improve the security um, of the front door. And that's um, uh, foreseen for fiscal 25. And then on the Hardy School, um, uh, roof replacement is in, in progress at the moment, about nearly half a million um, is scheduled for uh, rooftop units and other um, uh, energy and um, upgrades and boilers. And then um, the big item here is uh, envelope repairs um, for fiscal 26. So um, if we could look at the next slide and then that'll sort of complete these items. And then the one other sort of big ticket item here is the um, bracket uh, school playground renovation. Um, it's very difficult to get a good handle on the costs that are needed for these playgrounds, um, but uh, survey work was completed on the needs here. And so uh, this uh, 800,000, um, the idea is that it would be uh, needed in um, uh, the in fiscal uh, 25. The photos here show some of the degradation that's in place. And we know that we have to be careful with playgrounds. They have to be extremely safe. That's what makes uh, this equipment um, surprisingly expensive or surprising to those of us who come across these numbers for the first time. Um, there are other school expenses that run at close to uh, half a million a year, things like the photocopier leases and um, energy efficiency projects sprinkled around the schools, 
various security updates um, and um, a few other bits and pieces, dividers in the gym and Autoson that are absolutely needed. Um, but we haven't detailed those here because we wanted just to keep the focus on the, the big ticket items that uh, really can be, can be budget busters indeed. Um, the um, Autism School uh, uh, last summer, when we got our initial capital plan, uh, as Ida mentioned, um, there were requests for, for $5.4 million worth of um, basically maintenance and um, patch type upgrades. And nearly all of that has been cut. But um, if the Autism is not going to be substantially rebuilt within a few years, much of that is going to have to come back and indeed there will be some catch up needed. Um, so the expenses there are very considerable um, and we're kicking the can down the road on that one. Does anyone have any questions? Jennifer. Uh, yes, two questions. One is, um, I assume that we don't know yet what the Audison projects would look like if it were funded by the MSBA. So if it's a renovation or a rebuild or partial of one of the other, does that seem fair? That's fair. Okay. So, because I think some people are thinking we're just going to knock the building down. It, it may not look that way. It may look like a gut renovation instead or something. Quite possible. I think it's too early to say. Um... Right. Um, and then the other question and is, and I'm just new to this, I haven't followed all the capital projects. I remember there was a substantial problem at the bracket gymnasium. Has that been handled in a previous budget or is this something pushed off? I'll have to defer to someone else on that one. Okay. Is there anyone who can answer that question? I don't remember the bracket gymnasium, but we can find out and get back to you. Do you mind me asking, Jennifer, was it the HVAC? Yeah, I think it was. It had some serious um, problems, either being sometimes cold, sometimes hot, um, leaking water, like that kind of stuff, yeah, from what I remember. I don't recall seeing it in the, cap, in the capital projects in the past, but we can look into it. Yeah, I, I can't recall this one either, so we'll. <laughs> I'm afraid we'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay, Sorry. great, thanks wasn't on the list of requests that we received last summer. So either- Maybe there was an easier fix. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and sometimes some of these things get fixed out of the uh, recurrent budgets. Right. That turn right. out to be a little bit, uh, you know, there's a bit of money left over and they manage to, 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 to deal with it. Right, right. Okay. Also the school department has a school um, um, uh, building rental fund. And sometimes they, they tap into that fund to um, do temporary fixes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I don't see any other questions. So uh, continue on. Over to Jose, Mr. Farias for uh, the fire department. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Jose um, um, Farias, and I work for Alta Public Schools as a school accountant. Um, I'll try to sum this up as fast as I can, but feel free if you have any questions afterwards, I'll answer them. Um, we broke up the fire capital request um, between non-facility related requests and facility related requests. Um, the first non-facility related request includes the uh, rescue amb ambulance. Um, excuse me. So it's, it's part of the uh, six year lifespan and, and uh, similar to the ambulance, the protective gear has a, has a lifespan, but this one is about for 10 years. Um, and it, this this amount includes things like um, gear for the firefighters, like bunker pants, boots, hoods, things of that sort. Um, the next item on the list is the Lucas Three chest compression system, um, and this is more to assist patients in terms if they go under cardiac arrest. Um, the next item is another re uh, vehicle replacement program for the and. This is, uh, excuse me. So a part of the vehicle replacement program, we did include a pumper, which is why the amount is about 1.44 million. And that just uh, means replacing the traditional staff and support vehicles because um, they have a minimum lifespan of 10 years. And the, 
excuse me, and the C grade pumper has about life expectancy of about, about 20. Um, next item on the list is the jaws of life extraction equipment for about 50K. Um, and uh, it's been about, 10, it'll be about 10 years from FI21 for the recommended replacement. And the next item on the list is exercise equipment and the cost of that is about 50K. And that is just due to the wear and tear of the current exercise equipment of the um, that's current use. Um, and I think from there, I'll move on to the facility related request. On the next slide. Um, so some of these we broke down into the, the some of the buildings, Park Circle, Island Station, and Central's, Central Station. And the amounts are a bit different because of the, the different requirements. Um, Park Circle, some of the mechanical system replacements includes air handlers, um, apparatus bay heating unit, and a water heater for Highland Station. It's a bit higher because it includes uh, multiple boilers, hot water tank, and also a replacement of some roof top units. And then for the central station, it's it's just some some exterior waterproofing, in addition to other mechanics of replacement due to the wear and tear. And some of these include, um, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, that's sorry, that's that's about it. Sorry, I'm sorry, we'll be fast. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to share them, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, Carolyn. You're muted, Carolyn. I didn't ask about Audison because others beat me to it, but I will he hear. How long ago did we renovate, completely renovate the Park Circle fire station? And I remember specifically one of the things we were doing in renovating it was drastically improving the air quality because it was so bad for the firefighters there. So I'm a little surprised, I'm, I'm not quite sure what mechanical system replacement means, but I'm surprised that we need one already. And maybe it's been longer than I thought. I'll, I'll, I can take that to start here. Um, okay. and Jose, please jump in if you feel like it. But, sure. um, so we bundled a number of different items uh, as Systems replacements, and so, uh, and it's, it's a little bit different by each each building. Um, so it's a, it, at Park Circle, it's, it's air handlers, and um, I believe, uh, well, I was able to be able to correct me on on what's in those uh, in, in that bundle. I know the Highland one, for example, is hot water heater and um, rooftop units and um, some boilers. But just back to Park Circle, to your to your original question. Um, when did we last do something here? That was 2007. So it's been 16 years. Um, and um, what we were hearing from facilities is that the, uh, the mechanical systems that we're looking to replace have expected lifespans of 10 years. So they eked out beyond their original lifespan. And that's great um, with, with proper maintenance. That's, we, we, we preserve these things for longer than they were supposed to last, but eventually we have to replace them. Okay, great, thanks. Shirley. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, on, the, on the ambulance uh, issue, uh, I, I understand that, the, uh, that the, the money from the ambulance revenue has to go into the general fund now. And I saw that you have the offset uh, as pointed out in the answer to the questions on the five-year, um, as, as an offset on the five-year plan. Um, but I also heard that um, uh, Armstrong Ambulance was getting more revenue than they used to get out of the ambulance um, revenue stream. And I'm wondering uh, why that is. And if that means that we're getting less use or we're using the ambulances less, and do we need to? I can, uh, I can try to answer that question. Go ahead, Ethan. So I had a conversation with, uh, with the fire chief um, recently. Um, the reason why more revenue is 
it appears to be directed to the general fund as opposed to the revolving fund is because we have changed the policy on the transportation. And this happened after the pandemic due to the shortage of paramedics. Specifically, in the past, when uh, they would have a medical call, they will, uh, the fire department would respond and also the ambulance will respond. If it was just a basic uh, life uh, call, then our department, the fire department, does the transportation and all the money goes to the general fund. In the past, when they had the, um, an advanced call, advanced support call, they, uh, they, um, they would send, Armstrong would send a paramedic and we would be doing the transportation. So they have a rule uh, at the fire department or um, an understanding between the two that wheels bill. In other words, if we transported the patient with their paramedic, we will put the money in the, the revolving account, we'll give them Armstrong 60% for their um, paramedic and we'll keep the remaining in the um, revolving fund. Now, because of the shortage of, of the paramedics, they come, they come, they respond to the call and they do the transportation as well. So they take, they use their cars. They don't jump in our ambulance. When they do this, uh, the transportation, we don't even see the, the money. They do the collection for us. They send us the whole bill, let's say when we, their paramedic came with us and we paid them back 60%. But when they take care of everything 100%, they, Take, they, keep, they get to keep all the money. We don't even see the money. They don't come back to the town. So the hope is that we will go back to the old system, to the old policy as to um, us doing it all, both transportation, um, um, both transportations for BLS and ALS. But for now, this is the way it works. And um, we have to deal with, with the money that we have. So the question I have then is that says we have less use, less need to have uh, use of two ambulances. So why not just keep one in reserve for when there's a, a project breakdown and only buy one new one as opposed to the two that are in the plan? That one is, I think, in at 275 and the other's in at 350 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. We, we always need two ambulances. The fire department needs two ambulances. One is backup, either because let's say if sometimes they need it because they don't have, a, they have to roll it out because one is on a call. But most of the times they are not staffed for two ambulances. They're only staffed for one. One is always the backup. They cannot- That's, that's my point. That's my point. If we're not, if we're not using it and, and, and um, Armstrong has taken over a, a big chunk of the transportation, why are we spending the money on two ambulances? We are still using it, and if the, if if our current if one of them breaks, we still need a backup to respond to all the BLSs. But a new a it's, new backup at three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I don't know if it's a. a I uh, I'm not sure if it's. Um, we would get rid of the old one, so we'd always have two rescue, two always two ambulances. But I'm assuming there, that we are retiring one. Aren't there two purchases in the five year plan? Yeah, so I, I can fill it in. It, so basically they have a six year lifespan. And so what happens is they get rotated every three years. So for three years, the one in the front line. And then after that, it gets, it gets put in reserve for three years. So that's why you'll see two ambulances in the- um, Okay, but that still doesn't answer the question. If Armstrong's doing the work, then the lifespan is gonna ex go, go longer. Uh, we also, we had, had a brief discussion of this uh, in committee and we also wondered about whether we need ambulances that are this expensive, but we didn't have additional uh, data as of now to, um, to investigate further. But uh, given that it's a little bit out, um, I think it's something that the committee might want to, we might want to look at more carefully um, next year. I'll also just add to that, that so, um, well, I, I hear you, Charlie, uh, that the, if, you know, if patterns remain the way they are, then we may want to revisit the out year purchase. Uh, can it be extended further out into the future? Uh, if they revert to where they used to be, um, 
we're back to you know transporting and they won't they always want to have a backup so that if the ambulance has taken somebody out of town to a hospital and there's another call that they have to respond to they have that backup thank you uh, the i have a question the exercise equipment are is that in all of the buildings all of the fire stations and the police station or is it in one location um give me one sec um give me one sec let me double check sorry I know it's in the central uh, station because I've seen it, which is where yeah. we meet with Chief Kelly, but I've not been in, you know, the other two stations, so I can't say with my own eyes. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I do have the quote in front of me, see so if that gives me any more information. I just put this out. Is it cheaper to buy gym memberships for people? But um, <laughs> uh, Carolyn, you have a, your hand raised. Yeah, I'm not I, sure. I just want to... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jose. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'm not sure if it's every building, but I do know that it's going to be about three three treadmills, um, some al alpine treadmills, in addition to something called a uh, uh, three three stair masters, and that's where the, the the mount comes from for the exercise equipment. So they're basically ordering nine different types of equipment, in addition to the shipping. That seems pricey, but. Carolyn, go ahead. They they are on shift for 24 hours at a time, but yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you. Um, so I want to go um, piggyback on Charlie. I would hope you would look at um, whether or not we should be extending the life of the ambulances beyond three years to four or five, um, at least to four, if we're, we're having that much decrease in their use. And that's it. Oh, oh yeah, Karen. They're they're on a six year. So as what happens is three years, they're in use. I'm sorry. So then, so then, so then consider an eight year extension. You know, the reality is they could probably last a bit longer unless there's significant changes in technology. Thank you. We'll definitely keep that uh, in mind as the next ambulance marches its way through the plan. Uh, Annie. Um, so I can give you a little bit of history on that exercise equipment. Um, I believe that it was originally purchased using a grant that um, some members of the fire uh, department went after in somewhere around 2005. And yes, it's in all of the fire stations because I did a tour of all the fire stations when I first got elected and saw the exercise equipment in all of the fire stations. Um, I believe that at the time they assumed that was sort of an experiment, but that it made a huge uh, difference in the physical health of firefighters. And that's probably why they want to replace it. Thanks, Annie. Any other questions? All right, go. All right, on. thank you. Back to me. Thank you, Mr. Frias. Now the other half of community safety, the police department. Um, Bullet one, we've got the annual appropriation of um, $150,000 for vehicle re replacement, typically three vehicles per year, uh, it's usually one mark, uh, sorry, two marked cars, and then one unmarked car or one motorcycle. Um, this is an increase over last year because of inflation uh, in vehicle costs. Number two is um, quarter million, three, uh, one, sorry, one quarter of a million dollars for a cooling tower replacement. Uh, this will be paid for. Uh, using ARPA funds for HVAC. Um, in the 2017 police station renovation, the cooling tower was not replaced. And uh, the assessment of both uh, facilities and the occupants, the police department, is that it's undersized to cool the building. It's, it gets pretty hot in the summer. Um, so the replacement cooling tower will have the increased capacity needed for this building. Item three, it's called the QED server. It's um, for $15,000. It's um, the police department's report and uh, uh, report writing and tracking system. Occasionally it goes down and then they have to take all the reports by hand and then they have to enter it all later on. Uh, this has been maintained for eight years, but it, uh, town IT says it has a usual lifespan of five years. So it's 
beyond its end of its useful life. Um, and it has to be its own separate server because of the sensitivity of the data that's stored on it. Item four, uh, we show a picture here. It's called the Bolo Wrap. These are um, they're, they're non-force options. They're used to uh, shoot a set of uh, weighted filaments that wrap around a, uh, uh, an offender and um, immobilize them from a distance. Um, they're piloting a few of these now, and then they, they've liked what they've seen. They're, they want uh, the additional 15K to purchase 10 more units to outfit all of their cars. And so every, they'll have it in every um, one of their marked cars, as well as at the, at the headquarters. Um, we actually, uh, when we heard about this, we said, why do you want it in fiscal 28? Let's pull it forward. It sounds like a great idea. Um, beyond that, we've uh, shifted uh, the cost of the bulletproof vest to the operating budget. Um, you'll see also some out year costs here for some vehicles. And that's the, the police department. Any questions about the police department budget? Okay, All right. keep going. We'll pass it over to Joe, the Joe Barr to talk about the recreation department. Uh, good evening. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of current year requests, uh, most of it is for three ongoing programs that kind of cycle through every year. Um, playground audit and safety improvements. So this is doing, as it says, audits of the current condition of the playground. And then if, if there are kind of immediate or fairly emergent uh, improvements that need to be made, they can get done using these funds. So that's 70K this year just to kind of balance things out and then but normally 75 per year uh, going forward. Um, the uh, implementation program for the ADA, ADA retrofit program study that was done a while ago. Um, so recreation is just kind of working their way through um, accessibility to the town's playgrounds. Uh, and this is 50K a year. Um, obviously when playgrounds get renovated, they address the accessibility needs there, but there's a lot of um, uh, pieces that need to get done kind of before they get to a full renovation. And then the last ongoing one is the feasibility study program, which allows them to kind of study uh, what's needed at each playground and each park, and then, um, you know, scope out the work so that when, then when they come to us with a request to actually do the work, it's, it's a little bit better uh, fleshed out. Um, and then the one non-recurring is they want, they are asking to do a study uh, for sort of reconfiguring and reworking um, the parking uh, lot and the sort of adjacent areas um, at the at, at the arena, and this would kind of come up with both a plan, but also some conceptual designs for what what this would look like in the future. And it's not just about the parking; it's also about, like I said, reconfiguring some of the areas around or adjacent to it. Um, next slide. Um, and then in terms of um, progress um, to date, uh, there's three. ARPA-funded playgrounds at, at the Bishop Pierce and Stratton schools that are, are largely complete as of last year with some you know, punch list items and things that can't get done until the weather warms up a little bit, um, you know, but those are functionally done. But I think it's important to say that you know, we've not had to fund playgrounds out of the capital plan for a few years, both because of the um, CPC, C, yeah. The Community Preservation Act Committee, it's actually easier to say that, the whole thing than the acronym, um, funding them, or most recently ARPA, as Timur referred to, has been funding a lot of things related to playgrounds and other things as well. So when we look out into the, the future years of the plan, <clears throat> 25, 26, 27, we have some um, significant projects, uh, two renovations at Parallel Park and Waldo Park, um, and then um, some initial design work for Thorndike Field, which would be a much more significant project if it if it turns out to be uh, something that, that the town wants to pursue, the 250 k is just for laying out the initial design. But again, I think the, the larger point is that you know these program these pr projects are going to start to come back to the capital plan in a way that they haven't um, for a few years. Any questions? Any questions, anyone? I don't. See any? Thank you. Over to Ida for Great. the library. Um, Char Charlie has a question. Oh. Charlie, do you have a question? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I'd like to come back to this, uh, to the subject of the um, 
study programs and the ADA programs uh, after the presentations are, are through. I just have some questions and concerns about that. So next, Timur. Uh, over to Ida for Ida. libraries. I have a library slide um, and then um, I will come back for the debt. So the library um, has a small request this year. Uh, they only have three requests. One is the recurring MNL uh, project. Um, one is the EMS system. And the one you have, see here on the screen is the lighting project. Um, this is a lot smaller compared to the previous year requests, which were to the tunes of tens of millions of dollars with those two libraries. Um, but just because we kicked out the libraries out of the current plan, it doesn't mean that the projects went away. So the um, library dire uh, director has a, a pretty large uh, list with projects that need to be addressed in the you know, very near future. And she's in the process now of determining um, the priority of those projects as well as the funding because she does have um, alternate funding so um, uh, funding sources from outside such as CDBG, um, Friends of Libraries, um, the trust funds and various donations. But for this year, she considered that the highest uh, priority um, goes to the lighting project because we need a greener and brighter library. The problem, the current problem with the core illuminating now is um, the, the current fixtures are out of date and um, they're not uh, very um, efficient uh, when it comes to energy use. And also they're not, they don't provide a sufficient lighting. Um, there are many areas throughout the library where, uh, which are dim and actually some rooms they go completely dark if there's no motion. So patrons think that those specific rooms could be closed. She engaged a vendor and the scope of this project is to completely remove um, uh, the old lighting and um, replace it with the new LED fixtures and retrofits. The total cost of the project is uh, 155,743, but this includes also the Eversource, Eversource rebates um, which is um, actually, this rebates are part of a larger uh, program called Mass Saves. Um, if we um, do this project, we will realize save, annual savings of $30,000, which translates into a payback period of five, uh, five years. The chart you have here on the slide doesn't have anything to do with the project, it's just here to illustrate that the actually, um, Post pandemic, the, the circulation has increased at the libraries and um, both contents, uh, digital content and physical materials um, have seen an increase um, after the pandemic. That's all we have for the libraries tonight. Uh, L. Jones has a question, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, a few years ago, there was talk of a major addition on the back of Robbins. Is that still lingering out there or what? Yeah, so um, we had, if I remember correctly, it was like 12 million for Robbins Library, which included renovations and addition, and about 8 million for the Fox Library. But of course, budgetary constraints pushed, uh, forced us to push them out. Um, yes, it's the um, Anna's desire to pursue this project, but we don't know when this is going to happen as soon as we make more room in the budget. So it's sort of an indefinite, it's not in the plan anywhere. It's just, in, you know, it, indefinite at this point. It's in the back of her mind, yes. Okay. Maybe it's on the wish list. Robin sisters. It's on the wish list, yeah. It, right, okay, thank you. Any other questions regarding libraries? Okay, moving on. All right, back to me for one more. Um, other general items. Uh, so, the biggest one here is we have a planning study in fiscal 24 for a future capital project, which is the Veterans Memorial Park. You'll see a rendition of it here. It's envisioned to be a total redo of the space in Broadway Plaza. Um, at the upper left corner is the monument, and then at lower right is where the uh, central fire station is. Um, so um, $200,000 in this year for the planning, and then actual construction would be in 25 and 26. Total cost for that is on the order of $2.6 million. 
Uh, notably, um, we are looking at uh, a large portion of this, over 60% of it to be coming from outside funds, from state uh, earmarks, from federal earmarks, um, from other uh, grant applications and from donations. And we've um, been clear with the planning department that we're counting on this, that there's no infinite backstop. We can't say, oh, you didn't come up with the money, we'll give it all to you because we, we can't afford it. So we want to just be clear that we're expecting uh, a substantial other commitment from the, from the town, from these different uh, outside sources in order to, uh, to help fund the, um, uh, the necessary upgrade for this memorial. Um, I mentioned before the Ro Whittemore Robbins estate. This is the building behind the library, um, oh, sorry, the Robbins Library uh, and the associated, there's a, a cottage and carriage house. Uh, Whittemore Robbins is mostly used currently for AYCC, the Youth Counseling Center. And um, the scope of this project was originally um, about uh, half, as, uh, half again as large. Um, and we have uh, carried on the scope to focus on Create the space for the for AYCC both in the existing uh, building and in the uh, the cottage, and also in doing some exterior repairs. Uh, there was some talk about um, looking at rehabbing some additional uh, space in the carriage house. That would be a rental property for you know citizens to rent from the town and then have their own events there. And we didn't deem that to be a, a good use of town uh, revenue, uh, town resources to do that renovation for that carriage house. So that's on uh, indefinite hold for now. Uh, and we're, we're focusing on, on, on these core um, town services uh, in the buildings for half a million dollars. The community center, um, this is a, um, the elevator in there was not part of the scope of the, uh, the renovation that is nearing completion. Um, the elevator was installed back in 1982. Uh, so over 40 years old, had an expected lifespan of 20 years, and has been able to work mostly, but less since less so recently. And it's being frequently asked service is a problem. It is a senior center, um, and uh, if you're trying to get between floors and the elevator isn't working, that's a big problem. It also makes the building non-ADA compliant. Um, there's uh, a $100,000 uh, budgeted amount for uh, ADA accessibility upgrades. This is really to uh, remedy whatever architectural barriers they, there may be at uh, town properties that challenge people's access. So um, steps where, where you might need a ramp or lifts over, uh, over, over threshold and so forth that are hard for wheelchairs to cross over, et cetera. Um, so that's a, a, an ongoing expense that we have in the plan. An additional ongoing expense is, I mentioned this before in passing, um, $400,000 per year for PCs for our students and teachers. Um, this will buy about 1,200 PCs in a given year. Um, and these are um, laptops, uh, Chromebooks and so forth. We refresh them on about a four to five year cycle. Uh, and that way we, we uh, get them through uh, for several years and cover the entire population of our, our school district. Um, and it really is students, I think, that are in grades three and up as well as teachers. Um, and some of those uh, Chromebooks probably see a little bit of hard use with those kids. So um, it's, uh, it's an ongoing need, but um, some of the work that the kids do, even at a very young age of you know, eight or nine uh, with their laptops is quite remarkable. And I'll pause there. Any questions? Rebecca. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question about the planning of the Veterans Memorial Park. Um, we had Mass Ave rebuilt in East Arlington, and I know that ultimately, eventually, the hope was to have Mass Ave rebuilt um, through Arlington Center. And as part of that, there was, in the sort of brainstorming stages, there was a possibility that the way that Broadway intersects with Mass Ave might be kind of reconfigured, and the shape of that park might change. So um, do you know... I, I guess I'm a little concerned that if we're going to plan a new park and then it turns out that the orientation of the park and, you know, what part is park and what part is parking lot on Broadway changes, is, there, is, there, is that a concern at all? It's a concern. I mean, um, 
the configuration that you're, you see here is pretty much in line with the current configuration. It's got the cars parked on the Broadway portion, you know, nose in. Um, so, yeah, I know that there, that there was talk about rescoping how the traffic flow would be at the end of Broadway, and um, I've not heard of any uh, resolution to that. Okay, but hopefully they're at least, I guess, thinking about it. I just would be concerned if yeah. there was somehow, you know, we we designed this wonderful new park and then, and then the park ended up being, you know, arranged slightly old. differently because of the parking yeah. lot. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Timor, if I can add, since I had that. Um, Thanks. The department is one of my projects. They, um, Rebecca, they're definitely working with the planning department. Um, so hopefully they'll they'll stay in sync. Thank you very much. Shirley. I'll, I'll, wait, I'll, I'll wait till we get to the end of the uh, presentation. Dave, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, uh, on the, uh, the Veterans Memorial Park, um, the last presentation I went on, on that uh, design plans, uh, that was mentioned, the concern about the um, Broadway meeting ma uh, adjoining Mass Ave. And the, uh, th that concept that was that was out there was um, put to bed, if you will. So what we have now is, is, is being presented on tonight, that that's, that's the design that they're gonna go with. Thanks, Dave. Um, I don't see any other hands, so continue on, Tima. All right, back to Ms. Cody. Can you please move to the new, uh, next slide? All right, so the next three slides are about um, actually uh, borrowing. This is um, pretty much a standard proce procedure. Um, we, um, we want, to, we need to uh, receive the prior um, authorization to borrow funds. Um, in, tw in 2014, the town meeting authorized the treasurer to borrow $2 million to replace the water meters. Um, to date, we've only spent $1.7 million and we have learned that ARPA is picking up the tab for the rest. To, to finish up the installation of this um, water meters. Therefore, we do not need to borrow this money. However, we do have it recorded as authorized and unissued on the books. Um, the town meeting has to vote to rescind the, to rescind the authorization. Uh, and in turn, I will remove it from the books and report it to DOR as such. If there's no questions, we can move to the next one. Okay, go ahead. Um, this is the reappropriation of borrowed funds. Um, this is actually part of our large sweeps. In other words, we have projects that, a, a number of projects that, that came under budget um, and the total amount is um, somewhere around um, $546 million. Of this 546, 203 are restricted funds because we borrowed this funds to do the projects. Now, um, we have two options. We can either use this available balances to pay down the debt service, or we can reappropriate this funds to complete other projects. However, the bond council requires that if we reappropriate this funds, we need to map them um, to uh, some projects, we need to identify projects that for which we could borrow for the same term or longer. And we did so. In this slide, we, um, we presented the projects that came under budget. So we have the available balances of 203. And in the next slide, we have the mapping to the new projects where we would like to apply this funds. But in order to do that, it, they have to be disclosed and voted. Any questions? Was clear enough? Oh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions about what Ida just covered? I don't see any hands up. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cody. We're in the home stretch here. Um, 
after all the detail that you've seen from us, we hope your heads aren't exploding. And you've seen this slide before to recap what we're asking to you to do tonight. Again, vote favorable action on our budget for fiscal 24, the reappropriation and the, and the rescission that Ms. Covey just covered, and then more broadly to endorse the five-year plan. There's one more slide that Ms. Cody will be presenting. Charlie, do you have a question that we can answer now? Charlie, do you have a hand up? Yes, I do. Um, so it, it, um, if I could raise a general question, it actually covers several of the presentations that were just uh, given. And, and let me start off by saying that the uh, presentation by the Capital Planning Committee and the work that that's been done is really outstanding. And um, I, you have my, uh, my respect and my, my gratitude for the, for the work that you do and for the, and, and you team are for your leadership. Um, but I have a very uh, uncomfortable uh, reaction to a couple of line items in the different categories. And years ago, we had- Charlie, Char Charlie can I interrupt? Before yeah. we get into the, that, those questions, I just want, before we launch into more general questions, I want everyone um, to understand what the Capital Planning Committee is asking us to approve. Um, once everyone is settled on that, then we can go to any other questions that we haven't answered. Um, so I think on slide 37, Timur, is the- yeah, so let, let, let's pass over to slide 37. We'll come back to that. Thank you. Um, so back to Ida. To, uh, Ms. Cody, will you walk us yeah. through the recommended book, please? Sure. So this is the, the very final- Sophie has, Sophie has her hand up. Sophie, do you have a question as to what we're clarifying right now? Or is um, it well, it's just a quick question on the reappropriation. So I don't know if it's too specific or not for this point. You, you can tell them not to answer if you prefer. Um, on the ADA funds, do we know specifically what the 100,000 is for or it's just a general 100,000? And my concern goes back to funds being used by the Disability Commission on some capital you know, on, on things like the doors for the select board that it actually came out of the committee budget. So I just want to make sure somehow we track what's coming from where. Um, is that something we'll know or this is just a general 100,000? We've allocated $100,000 in cash for ADA accessibility constructions in general across the town. Um, I don't have the exact details here, um, but I can find out um, from someone who probably will have who interviewed planning, um, but this is in general for ADA constructions. All right, so uh, back to you, Timor. Ms. Cody? Or Ida. Slide uh, 37, please. Yeah, this is the very final slide and it's a high level summary of what we are um, asking you to vote for the capital expenditure. Um, many times the commission, uh, the committee, this. Uh, committee asked what is the final number that we actually have to vote. So we put that whale there. Um, you need to uh, vote the total net capital appropriation. Um, I hope you're not going to ask me what the, the, um, the, um, significant, the symbol of this whale is because I can't remember uh, the whole story. Maybe we should change it next year to Sandy's picture because it was something that came up in his classes. Um, but anyway, so the bottom line that we need you to vote is the total net capital appropriation of 22,380,767. This actually includes the total debt service. Um, you will see at the bottom uh, for the general fund, 19,183,900. Uh, but then we also have um, other financing sources that we will be using. So um, the, the the net, the, the new net general fund uh, that will be 18, 446, 911. And of course the cash capital appropriation of 3,933,856. Um, you've seen these details in the um, previous slides. 
So we ask you to endorse our plan and approve the capital expenditure of the 22,380,767. And then you also want um, us to approve um, rescinding um, prior borrow borrowing in the amount of 300,000, correct? Correct. Which I think is Article 40 of the warrant, am I right? Uh, I had a it's a separate article, that's right. And the reappropriation, um, is that a warrant article as well? It's a component no. of the uh, of the, the capital. Um, okay, got it. All right, so you want a separate vote on that as well? Or it, will that be just incorporated in the, the bottom line capital budget? I would say it's in the bottom line. Okay. All right, so um, uh, if anyone has any questions as to what we just covered, raise your hand so people understand what it is we're being asked to approve. Um, I don't see any hands raised for that. So if anyone has just general questions um, on um, the capital plan that we haven't already um, covered. So um, uh, Charlie, what questions do you have for the capital planning committee? Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. So I'm, I'm um, not gonna repeat the kudos I started to mention before, but I think the, the plan is you know, very, in general, very well done. And I thank everybody for their work, but I have some concerns in, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Cody just uh, touched on one of them with respect to this uh, ADA appropriation uh, and and Sophie asked the question about it. You know, hundred thousand dollars. What is it for? We have uh, several categories in the capital plan that seem to have grown over the years. Uh, it it started out as in the recreation department. You know, ten thousand dollars for planning the next um, uh, rec, you know uh, park improvement. And but now we have a hundred thousand dollars a year for. Uh, electrification studies in the planning department. And we have, uh, I think, I'm, I'm not looking at that screen, but I think we have in the same five-year plan, uh, $50,000 a year for uh, undetermined, unspecified engineering studies for the planning department. We have uh, 50 or $100,000 a year for ADA improvements, again, not specified. Um, I and I think there are more, but you know, we're talking about numbers that are in the three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year range in the aggregate. And and uh, it, to me, uh, you know, over four years, that's over a, a million dollars. And that to me is not a tight capital plan. That, that that's you could drive a coach and four through through some of those gaps. Um, so I, I'm just concerned that we're that the plan is heading in the wrong direction with the, especially when, for example. I read the school department's electrification study and, and the conclusion of the study was it's gonna cost uh, $10 million of building to do these electrification changes. So are, are we, we have 22 buildings in town. Are we gonna spend uh, $10 million on all of those 22 buildings as a result of this $100,000 a year electrification study? If so, uh, maybe we shouldn't be uh, spending that money in the first place. Um, so that's, that's one set of a whole range of categories that I question in this plan. And uh, another big item that I question is in the DPW area, these toters for the, I think it's called toters for the, for the um, uh, trash collection. And, and that seems to me to be something that uh, I'm, I'm not sure how you categorize it, but if, if they're distributed to everybody's um, house, right? then I don't understand how that can be a capital item because there's no control over the asset and there's no um, guarantee that the asset's gonna be maintaining its value. I, so, I mean, it, there's just some questions here that um, are troubling. And I, I don't know, I tried to express some of these in the, in the, uh, in the questions that I sent to, to um, uh, Daryl, but I, I'm, 
I still think there are gaps in this that I, that that are very troubling. And I don't know if uh, Capital Planning Committee wants to comment on any of that. Um, Timor, do you or anyone on the Capital Planning Committee have a response to um, those items that Charlie raised? Uh, I'll take them quickly. So um, we do studies. We do studies uh, and uh, it's been a longstanding policy since before I was chair that if we are doing a, a plan or a study in, in preparation to decide what we should be spending on a capital improvement or a capital asset, uh, it's capitalizable. Um, so, you know, as to do an electrification study to figure out how we can possibly get this town to be compliant with our net zero goal by 2050, I think it's 2050, and um, yeah, it's gonna cost a lot of money. And we spend some money to figure out how much it's gonna cost us and what has to be done. Um, so that's what we're talking about with, with that study for electrification in particular and for studies in general that we're doing here is, you know, trying to get the best number and the best scoping for future capital projects. Um, I hear what you're saying about ADA. I think that um, uh, it would be delightful if we could get a item by item specification of what the $100,000 would be going for in a given year. We, were, we understand that, that this number is put to good use every year and we can get a you know, reckoning of what it's spent for, for the accessibility uh, of town properties and so forth. Um, so um, I don't see the practicality of asking for, you know, an itemized punch list in advance of what has to be done for all the, all the projects. We could certainly ask for a bit more detail and provide that. Um, and to the point about the toters, um, the toters are not in 24, they're an out year item. We are still looking at, at the, um, the plan. The plan is proposed because uh, of the, the growing trend among towns to switch to automated pickups. So you have these loaders that come and grab the toters and then pick them up and drop them into the, into the garbage trucks. Um, and so we are looking at, uh, and, I, and we do not have a cost benefit study that says how much more will it cost us for doing it the current way versus a uh, better deal uh, for using these toters. And so basically you're talking about putting an investment in for these, for, for these uh, items and they'd be distributed to the different households throughout town. Um, back of the envelope says if it's, a, if it's one and a half million dollars and there's 15,000 households, it's a hundred dollars per household for these um, specialized garbage cans. And uh, they're supposed to have a 10 year long lifespan uh, and that we can get half of the, of the cost reimbursed by the state, the Department of Environmental Protection. So that's sort of the, the upfront investment side. And yes, we do need it uh, to understand uh, if it really is worth it from a uh, you know, return on investment, time to break even, and we don't have that yet. And when we are asked to actually fund this in the plan, perhaps next year, that's when it's currently slated for, we'll, you, you can be sure that we'll be asking for that. Good. Good. Thank you. If, if I might just add a couple of quick things. We uh, did get a request last summer for um, improved boilers at the Pierce School that would cost um, $600,000. And one reason they were so expensive is they um, were electrical with uh, heat pumps. And on further examination, um, we uh, the same the equipment could be um, replaced for half that price um, if it were uh, continuing to use gas. And that's the direction we took. Um, but I do think a conversation is needed at some point about how much we're willing to pay um, for the electrical side. The thinking of the committee was, as of now and for the lifetime of the, those equipment, um, gas would still be at the margin what is being used to uh, generate the electricity. So the advantages um, environmentally of moving to heat pumps at this point were not obvious given the cost differential. But um, so that was one specific example where uh, we're, we're wrestling with the problem. Another example was, as mentioned earlier, the um, proposal for um, EV um, charging stations 
And our sense was that the proposal as it came to us was sort of give us money and we'll see what we can do with it. And we felt that that wasn't specific enough and it didn't identify a felt need that needed the funding. That doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad idea. It just didn't strike us as um, clear enough for the current purposes. So I think the concerns you're raising are concerns that the committee's been trying to grapple with, and they're not um, they're not easy ones to always resolve. Thank you, uh, Elle Jones. You had a hand up. Uh, did you have a question? Uh, well, I actually put it in the chat. It was, it's, a, it's almost a typo. I think the new non-exempt debt number here is actually ban interest. Is that correct? Not that it makes that much difference. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. That was all. Thanks, Al. Um, Charlie, um, you have your hand up again. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I, I uh, uh, under, thank you, uh, Mr. Houghton, for your your comments. Um, I I uh, think your phrase of uh, you know throw us some money, we'll see what we can do with it, is really a very much my concern. And and uh, with that the the line about the electrification with in the in the five year plan, it's a hundred thousand dollars a year for five years, as I recall. And and I just I'm deeply concerned about. Uh, categories like that, and I mentioned three or four of them. So that's that's really what I was drawing attention to. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Any other questions? Anybody have anything else that they have for the Capital Planning Committee or uh, the Capital Planning Committee have anything to say? Joe Solomon. Yeah, just real quick to tag onto what Timur had said. Um, actually reached out to Charlotte Milan, who was in um, our, our recycling coordinator, just to give a little bit more color on that, is that th there was a, a takeover of the town's current waste management company by another company. And because of Arlington's contract, we had the ability to um, essentially veto that takeover. And that, that allowed us to gain very favorable terms that at in the near future will run out. So the, the total issue isn't just the efficiency in the market moving to that, but we also have favorable terms that that end at some point. So we sort of have that double hit of having to go to a market standard and, you know, having a, a favorable contract run out. Thank you for that. Topher. Just a comment on us. I believe Belmont has started to use toters. So that might be a source of you know, on the ground information about how they work out and whether there's any hidden gotchas with moving to them. I think Medford has as well. Anything else that anyone has? All right, I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Um, Team Laura and everyone else on the Capital Planning Committee, thank you for your presentation. I, I second everything that Charlie said. Uh, as it always is, it is extremely thorough um, and uh, clear. Uh, and we on the Finance Committee greatly appreciate that. And I also want to thank you, Timor, and Ida, and Daryl, and I think Julie, for the last few days, um, spending quite a lot of time answering individual questions that Finance Committee members had. Um, I think um, that responsiveness is, was really impressive. And uh, I think everyone um, appreciates the effort that, that you uh, made. Um, so again, thank you. Um, and um, we really appreciate it. Thank you all. We appreciate the opportunity and all your questions. We have a couple that we've been taking down that we owe you some responses on. Um, so we'll get those two back to you through, through Daryl as, as soon as possible. Uh, and with that, that concludes our report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, all right, everyone, we have uh, just 10 minutes left in our meeting. Um, I see two hands come up. Uh, uh, Chair, first Chair Gessler, do, do, you want, do you want the, uh, the capital planning committee members to, to depart at, at this time? You, you can stay or you can go. It's completely up to you. I, I, we, Madam we, Chairman, 
I, yes, Charlie. I have a serious, have a serious question here. Uh, I, I'd like to, I'd like to know, uh, uh, Mr. Yantar, uh, if if you are uh, giving appropriate credit to uh, to Luke uh, 1428 for your motto. That is the uh, the Latin source, correct? Yes. I believe it's in the Vulgate Latin uh, Bible. Um, First, Luke. sit down and count the cost. Yeah. It, check check it out. <laughs> just the, just an aside. Thank you. El Tosti. Thanks all. Thank you, Timor. You're you're muted, El. I just had one comment on the uh, Topher's. Uh, I spend January in a place that uses them extensively. If you've got a lot of parked cars on the street, they don't work. Uh, and uh, th that could be a big problem. Uh, Madam Chairman, I just, uh, if it's appropriate, I just wanted to make a motion uh, for the appropriation uh, as stated in page 37 of 22 million 380. 767 and uh, the rescission of 300,000 under Article 40 of the warrant. Second. All right, I have a motion which has been seconded. Um, um, it, any other, any further discussion on the Capital plan request. Tara notes that we need a third uh, in the chat. She notes something. She I say? don't think we do. I think Ida confirmed that the um, reappropriation is included in the the recommended vote of twenty two three eight eighty seven sixty seven. So I think we just need to vote on this bottom line plus the precision of, of borrowing. Um, any discussion? All right, let's take it to a vote. All right, all in favor of approving the Capital Planning Committee budget requests, um, say aye, Jordan. Yes. Shane. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Sophie. Yes. Uh, Carolyn. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. John. Yes. Daryl. Yes. Annie. Yes. L. Jones. Yes. Topher. Yes. Peggy. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. Dean. Yes. Dave. Yes. All right. The capital planning budget has been approved unanimously. And right. Article 40. What's that, Al? And Article 40. And Article 40, correct. All right. Um, we have six minutes left. Um, I, how about um, doing quickly the, the minutes of the last meeting? I don't think it would take a whole lot of time. Um, Tara, could you pull up the minutes of March 6th? Does anyone have any um, corrections to the minutes of March 6th? Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. second. All right, the motion has been moved and seconded. Let's take it to a vote. Jordan? Yes. Shane? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Sophie. Abstain. Carolyn. Yes. Rebecca. Yes. Grant. Yes. Charlie. Yes. 
John. Yes. Daryl. Yes. Annie. Yes. Al Jones. Yes. Topher. Yes. Peggy. Yes. Al Tosti. Yes. Dean. Abstain. Dave. Yes. Fifteen votes to approve with one two abstentions. So the minutes of the sixth have been approved. Um, all right. Um, we just have four minutes left. Um, let's I'll just briefly talk about scheduling. Uh, right now, uh, we have the water bodies um, scheduled to come in on next Monday, the 13th. Um, Carolyn, will you have reclass and human um, resources ready on, on Monday? We can definitely do um, human resources. Reclass, there is something that is still in the works. I'm not, which I just found out about today, it hasn't been resolved. Um, it may be resolved on, by Monday. And if it is, then I'll present. And if it's not, then we'll just hold that until that specific thing is done. But yes, we can move them there for now. All right, that would be good if we can do those. Um, um, since, since David Morgan is coming in with the Water Bodies Group, um, we'll also have him address the uh, Open Space Committee and Gas Leaks Task Force asks. Um, on Wednesday the 15th, the town manager will come in and talk about the various town manager um, warrant articles, uh, answer any questions that we may still have on things like open space committee and gas leaks. He'll also um, provide us with the latest five year long range plan. Um, so that will take up a chunk of our time on Wednesday. On the 20th, we have um, the Community Preservation Act people coming in. Um, and we, it looks like we will have a presentation by some school kids for um, that warrant article. Uh, and then on, on the 22nd, we have the schools coming in. Um, Carolyn, you ha have your hand raised. So I, I'm not going to be going to meet over at the school with others. They're coming to us. We're not going to do that little subcommittee meeting. They, Tara, do you have spoken to or have you? Yes, have you I, I'm sorry. I thought I sent an email to your group. Um, yeah, Tara, Tara's <laughs> uh, like reached out like super, super quick, amazingly, and got this done. Yeah, so it's going to be their teacher and probably six of the kids from the eighth grade um history uh, social studies class oh so I, th I thought we were going to meet with them separately and not have them come see the whole group so i had actually emailed them on sunday night so this conversation happened on monday um and uh so she the, the teacher responded to me with the email that i sent before the subcommittee was formed do we as a committee want them coming as a whole group I thought what, we'd, well, I mean, it's, you know, whatever. Can I just suggest that, you know, if they want to come and get the full process, I think we should let them do that. If they have parental permission and they have a crew that's, Jennifer, we still might want to reach out to the teacher and ask whether or not the kids would like a pre-meeting to kind of. Okay. Yep. I, I, I was going about to say, what we're expecting and how we behave and. Yep. We can do that. On and so forth. And then I would like, if I may have the chair's indulgence to just make a suggestion to the committee, which is that these are fairly young students and you're going to be tempted, I suspect, to pull your punches. And although I think we should be super polite, I don't think it helps them for us to be less than direct about our actual personal positions on the issue. Um, there are ways of doing that in an educational format rather than educational and polite but i have seen the select board tell a whole bunch of kids how great they were and how excited they were that they came and then vote against them and i think it sends a really mixed message 
and is more painful than just being honest about whether or not we believe this will fit in our financial future. If um, uh, Annie and Carolyn if, and Jennifer, if you can um, um, coordinate with Tara and get the reach out to this group before they come, uh, help them prepare for the presentation, get any information they have um, and circulate it to us, help them with any um, you know, presentation uh, to make it um, as efficient as, as possible. Will do. I took it off my list of things to do, but I'll put it back on. <laughs> I can start the email thread with the teacher and copy you all and just say we could, you know, if you, if it's a big imposition to come in, we could do the subcommittee kind of meeting just all together outside the finance committee or like regular meetings and or a kind of preparation session. with, I, with your group. I think actually the message uh, if, with, with your um, non chair of um, seem to be slightly different. It's We're happy to see them, but more that uh, we might want to meet with them first, just to give them a heads up and to maybe um, get them to, to submit some materials to us. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm less worried about materials than about the kids getting asked questions about the process. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I would be offering to the teacher to say, hey, there's a subcommittee of our members who would love to meet with your class and answer their questions about what to expect and so on and so forth. And if as part of the conversation, we also say, you know, these are the kinds of presentations we get from other committees. If, um, if they were asking for money, we need the information. Right, no absolutely. Matter. I just yeah. want to, yeah. 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 I think it's making clear to them, this is what other committees come to us with presentations. This is what they look like. Yeah. So this, this is what we need to know. We need, we need, dollar amounts not um uh yeah we need we need something that has dollars on it for us to make any kind of decision so, el toss do you have a hand up yeah i i just wanted uh, two things one is uh we've got a lot of budgets to do and if we're going to finish by the end of the month uh the town manager is going to take a good chunk of the night the cpa committee will take a good chunk of the night and the schools usually take a good chunk of the night. So we really don't have a lot of meetings left to get this done. So I think it would be good if they come before is that there's a set limit that they know, you know, it's 20 minutes. Um, and I think the members need to know, we're supposed to ask questions. We're not supposed to be giving opinions at, at, at this stage of the, of the game. We share the opinions with each other when we decide on what to, how to vote. So those are just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, Dean? Hi. Um, so my apologies, I wasn't here when you formed that stuff committee. Um, if possible, could I tag along with the existing subcommittee? I um, I think I, you know, my, my, my eighth grader mentioned that there was a group of kids that wanted to talk to me about this. And I guess I totally ignored that sentence when he said it to me. And now I know what he meant. And so I, I, I think I'd be a total like jerk if I ignored it. If they will have you, Dean, you're welcome to do it. <laughs> well, I think I should. That's I mean, great. I probably know two or three of them, so I, I can't ignore them. So we will be planning, let's, we're gonna be meeting in person. Um, um, until the through the rest of the process, as far as I am concerned, unless there's something that comes up like tonight, it, we were accommodating um, capital planning committee who had two people who were not very mobile. Um, but otherwise, we'll be meeting in person at the community safety building, and um, and if we don't, then we'll give you everyone plenty of notice of that. So uh, from now on, just expect to be meeting at the police station. Jennifer, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I, I'm I'm just trying to figure out our timing for facilities and DPW, and I think we were trying to um, aim for the week of the 20th, and I'm looking at it and not it's much likely that it won't fit in to that timing. Does that seem? I, I would plan for the 20th, and okay. if if uh, we we um, We'll use every moment of our meetings between now and the end, and, okay. and if if we can only we do, do a partial presentation or yeah. something, right? If we can only do facilities, Got it. okay, and, 
or street lighting or something like that, we'll 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 do what we can. Um, okay. So if if you and 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 Jordan and Shane can try to get those budgets ready, um, just let me know when you are ready, and I'll try to start fitting you in somewhere. Great, thanks, and we'll still plan for that. And then uh, just to urge the committee again, if there's any questions you have, to send them over sooner rather than later. In the best of possible worlds, we don't go back and forth too many times. So thank you. All right, do I have, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. See you on Aye. Monday. Aye. Oh.